In this video, we're going to use what we learned about ring flips of cyclohexane and apply that to substituted cyclohexanes. In this first example, we have a mono-substituted cyclohexane, meaning that it has one group on the cyclohexane ring. This particular example is methyl cyclohexane. I've drawn out methyl cyclohexane here, and you can see the two chair conformations of methyl cyclohexane shown here and here. In one of the conformations, that methyl group is in the axial position. In the other conformation, the methyl group is in an equatorial position. Let's draw out these two chair conformations. In this first conformation, you can see that the methyl group is up and axial. And in the second one I drew, you can see that that methyl group is up and equatorial. I added in the hydrogens here for clarity, but those are not required. So that means this carbon here is that carbon there, which becomes this carbon here in the chair flip, which is that carbon there in my drawing. Of these two chair conformations, the one on the right here is lower in energy or favored. Let's see why that is. On the left here, we see the situation where the methyl group is in the axial position. If you look at the Cydon view in the Newman projection here, you can see that what we have is a Gauss interaction. This Gauss interaction is steric strain. In the chair conformation, we refer to this as a 1,3 dioxyl interaction, because the methyl group on carbon 1 here has a Gauss interaction with the groups that are 3 carbons away, here on 3 and here on 5. In the ring flip, however, you can see this Cydon view here, and in the Newman projection, you can see that this corresponds to an anti-conformation. In the anti-conformation, we have less steric strain because there are none of those 1,3 dioxyl interactions. So that means that having that methyl group in the equatorial position is favored or lower in energy. And in general, we see that trend when we have larger groups in equatorial positions this is associated with less strain, and these conformations are typically preferred. This slide provides a little bit more information on 1,3-dioxyl strain. Let's compare to Gauss-butane over here, which has this Gauss interaction, and that's associated with 3.8 kilojoules per mole of strain. Now let's take a look at methyl cyclohexane when we have that methyl group in the axial position. The 1,3-dioxyl strain, where the methyl group interacts with both of these hydrogens here, is essentially just two Gauss interactions. A Gauss interaction with this carbon here, and a Gauss interaction with this carbon here. And you can see that based on the actual measured strain, 7.6 kilojoules per mole of strain is 2 times 3.8. So this is literally just two Gauss interactions. What happens if we change up that methyl group with something else? This slide shows the effect of different substituents on strain. In this first column, you see 1,3-dioxyl strain is measured in kilojoules per mole, and in this column over here, you see it measured in kilocals per mole. If we have a small substituent like fluorine, you can see that this has very little strain at 0.5 kilojoules per mole. As the size of the atom increases, you can see that the 1,3-dioxyl strain also increases. When we get down to something like a methyl group, as I mentioned, this value is 3.8 kilojoules per mole. As that group gets bulkier and we add carbons and hydrogens, again, that increases. The t-butyl group here is particularly strained at 11.4. Notably, the cyano group, Cn, is even less strained than fluorine, and that's because it takes on a linear geometry. So there's really very little interaction with the 1,3-dioxyl hydrogens. This slide gives us an idea of how the numbers that we saw in the previous slide translate to percentages of axial and equatorial. So in a cyclohexane that only has hydrogens attached, we of course have 50% axial and 50% equatorial. In this case, the molecule flips back and forth and has no preference for either the axial or equatorial position. Once we throw a methyl group in, now we have a strong preference for the equatorial position at 94.7%. This increases steadily as we add carbons. Once we get to something like a t-butyl group, 99.98% of the molecules are in that equatorial position. Now let's take a look at some disubstituted cyclohexanes. 
Dye substituted cyclohexanes will have two groups attached to the cyclohexane ring. This particular one is cis because you can see that the two groups are on the same side or pointed down. In cis 1,4 dimethyl cyclohexane, we have one chair conformation shown here on the left and one chair conformation here shown on the right. I'm going to number these carbons so that way you can see which is which. So carbon one here is this carbon here, and in the ring flip, it's that carbon there. That makes carbon four here and here. So at carbon one, we have a down methyl group. In one conformation, it is down an axial, and in the other conformation, it is down an equatorial. At carbon four, we have a down methyl group. In one conformation, it is down an equatorial, and in the other conformation, it is down an axial. If you were to compare these two conformations in terms of energy, you can see that each of these conformations have one axial methyl group and one equatorial methyl group. So these conformations would be equal in terms of energy. Now let's look at trans 1,4 dimethyl cyclohexane. In trans 1,4 dimethyl cyclohexane, the methyl groups are on opposite sides. Again, let's number around the ring. So at carbon one, the methyl group is down. So in one chair conformation, it's down an axial. And in the other chair conformation, it's down an equatorial. At carbon four, we have an up methyl group. In one conformation, it's up an axial. And in the other conformation, it is up an equatorial. Now we see a significant difference between these two chair conformations. This one on the left has two axial methyl groups. This is going to make this molecule highly strained because it will have lots of 1,3 dioxial interactions. The one on the right, however, has both of those groups in the equatorial positions. So this is going to be the favored conformation or the conformation that is lower in energy. When you're drawing your chair conformations, make sure that the groups that you draw are consistent with your hash wedge drawings. For example, in this top one, we have two methyl groups pointed down, so they should be down in our chair conformation. The only difference is that we're switching the group that is axial to equatorial. In trans, this one is down, so it should be down in both of our chair conformations. The other one is up, so it should be up in both of our chair conformations. In the bottom case, we also want to make sure that they're both on opposite sides, one up, one down, one up, one down. In this slide, we're going to take a look at Hayworth projections. Hayworth projections are another way to visualize your hashed wedge drawings. In the hashed wedge drawings, you can see that the X and the Y group are on the same side, or cis, and here in the Hayworth projection, they are on the same side, or cis. It's also common to draw the Hayworth projections with the hydrogens in there. We just use this line here. Notice that the Hayworth projection doesn't give us any information about axial or equatorial, similar to the hashed wedge drawing. In order to figure out whether these groups are axial or equatorial, we have to draw both chair conformations. In this one here, you can see that we have trans on opposite sides, and so that is also true in the Hayworth projection. Again, that Hayworth projection could be drawn like this. If you're given this Hayworth projection, and you have to draw out chair conformations of this particular molecule, make sure to label your carbons. On carbon one, I have the Y group pointed up, and on carbon two, I have the X group pointed down. If I do the ring flip, carbon one would still have Y up, but now it went from axial to equatorial, and carbon two would still have X down, but now it went from axial to equatorial. Let's also do cis. And since here my Y at one is up an axial, in the other conformation it's up an equatorial. The X at two is up an equatorial in one, 
and up an axial in the other. One tip for making sure you get these chair conformations to be correct is to be consistent with the way you number. So if you start with one here and you go clockwise, make sure you do the same thing and go clockwise when you're numbering on your chair conformation. If you number counterclockwise, you're going to end up with carbon X on the wrong carbon. Let's look at cis-1,3-dimethylcyclohexane shown here. You can see that the two methyl groups are on the same sides. So in our chair conformations, we want to do the same thing. Here's the methyl group at 1, and it's up. And here the methyl group is at 3, and up. In this case, they are both equatorial. In the ring flip, they are again both up, but now they're axial. The two axial groups are going to have a lot of 1,3-diaxial strain. So the favored chair conformation is this one on the left, where the two methyl groups are equatorial. In trans 1,3-dimethylcyclohexane, the methyl groups are on opposite sides. So the methyl group at 1 here is down, so it's down an axial here, and down an equatorial here. The methyl group at 3 is up, so it's up an equatorial here, and up an axial here. If you're comparing these two chair conformations, both of them have one axial methyl group and one equatorial methyl group. So these two chair conformations are both equally favored, and we would expect to see these in a 50-50 mixture. This concludes our discussion on chair conformations. On the exam, what you'll be expected to do is take a Hayworth projection or a hashed wedge projection and draw both chair conformations and compare them in terms of energy. In the next video, we'll talk about constitutional isomers.